Hi, this is Mark Margolis. I played T.O. on Breaking Bad. And if you don't start listening to Mr. Media, I'm going to have to ding my bell. Today on Mr. Media, I'll talk to Ken Danziger and Jeff Rush, co-authors of Alternative Script Writing, Beyond the Hollywood Formula, now in its fifth edition. Stick around. Alternative Today, Mainstream, tomorrow. So much media, so little time. Who keeps track of it all? That would be me. This is Bob Andelman, and this is a Mr. Media Interview, brought to you by Amazon.com, Audible.com, and 1-800-DIAL-DJs. Please stop by the website, MrMedia.com, click on our advertisers, support the show. And remember, there's more than a thousand interviews available at MrMedia.com. We've been doing this since February 2007. Hope you'll find something you like. And thanks for listening. Mr. Media is recorded live before a studio audience of Hollywood screenwriters who couldn't write their way out of a frozen banana truck, until they could, in the new new media capital of the world, St. Petersburg, Florida. Every couple of years, Ken Danziger and Jeff Rush are faced with a dilemma. How do we keep fresh a book called Alternative Script Writing when what was once alternative is more mainstream than anyone could have ever dreamed? Every generation of filmmakers since Thomas Edison has railed against the basic structure of the medium, whether it was talkies overtaking silence, narrative versus anti-narrative, or a general rejection of three-act format that so closely resembles live theater and its heart and soul. Don't know what I'm talking about? Early in the new fifth edition of their book, Danziger and Rush compare the work of two prominent directors whose films most everyone knows, Steven Spielberg and Steven Soderbergh. It's as simple as E.T. versus Sex, Lies, and Videotape, two hit movies that both happen to use lowercase letters in their titles. In a moment, I'm going to ask the co-authors to compare and contrast these two well-known filmmakers, but I think anyone who considers themselves a film fan knows how differently structured are the films of Spielberg and Soderbergh. You don't have to be a literal film student to gain a number of insights from alternative script writing, but the biggest one is right there on the cover. Instead of showing one or two film images, this edition gives us a photo of Christoph Waltz in Inglorious Bastards, a top a second image from, not a movie at all, but a landmark television series, AMC's brilliant Breaking Bad. The message is clear. Some of the most alternative script writing of our generation is being created not for film, but for cable television. Put that blue crystal meth in your bong and smoke it. Ken Danziger, Jeff Rush, welcome to Mr. Media. Thank you. Hi. Hey, nice to see you guys. Uh, So how about it? Is, Is TV kind of the new alternative uh, in, in the script writing business? Um, well, I argue that it is. Um, that trying to fill um, 13 episodes a season uh, over five or six seasons uh, poses a whole new kind of issue for the writer and opens up the kind of space and opportunity to really explore um, stories that can go in places they couldn't have gone in feature films. I think television also uh, satisfies the need that the audience has for novelty. So instead of uh, uh, presenting the usual fare on television, television is looking to present a Western, a Shakespeare, to present a uh, crime story like Breaking Bad as as tragedy uh, as well as good entertainment. So television is really a kind of new major center of creativity that 
appeals to the younger audience who is searching for new things, novelty. Does uh, cable television in particular, uh, where we see a lot of uh, fresh, uh, fresh things happening, is it... Does it rely on on a series having a, an alternative view, or is it that because they're doing a series, whether they're doing ten to thirteen episodes for cable, or or um, you know even twenty two for broadcast, that because there's so many episodes, there's an opportunity there to do a little creative script writing and to be a little different. You know, I I just went back and read our section on three act structure. And we talk about how three-act structure tends to privilege plot over texture. And I still think that's true. In long-form television, uh, which is much more episodic in its structure, um, there's a great more, deal more time before the, the uh, 13 episodes comes to a climax, during which the writer can sort of explore the thematic and textual material. So I think that's very much part of it. I'm just watching the series Justified, which is uh, astonishing. And there are a number of episodes before the story really grabs hold that are more like uh, sort of riffs on the theme than they are on, on straight story building. And they're terrific. So uh, just to pick up with what Jeff is saying, there, there, there's a kind of uh, tonal exploration that can go cheap or it can go deep. So in something like Justified, you know, we start light, but we're going a little deeper, a little deeper. And in something like Breaking Bad or 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 Deadwood, where or Mad Men, it's it's virtually you know it's Dostoevsky ish, you know, in, in where the writers take it. You know, it's 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 a wild journey, and it's exciting. Where do you guys put a show like uh, 24 uh, in that spectrum? When it started, of course, it was very novel because every episode was an hour. I, I mean, it literally took an hour of the 24 episodes. Is that, is that just a, a, a plot conceit, or was that alternative script writing in the way it was put together? One of the things about alternative script writing is that it emphasizes uh, the formal constraints of the medium. And certainly in the first few seasons when 24 was so new, the aspect of apparently continuous time and trying to structure a story in it exposed the sort of formal plot elements of, of the storytelling. And so you could watch 24 just for the action, but you could also watch it for the way each series, each episode was constructed to apparently cover an hour of time. So I think that element, more than its sort of episodic nature, has a, an alternative, um, you know, element. By the way, it's coming back as, as 12 hours. <laughs> right. I don't even know what that means. Yeah, yeah I, I, I saw that. I was kind of wondering, you know, if they're going to commit to coming back, why would they call it 24 and then make it 12? It doesn't make any <laughs> sense. <laughs> Although, you know, what are you going to do? Um, yeah. Have you found much uh, pushback, though, to the idea that that uh, there's alternative script writing happening in television as opposed to film? I mean, I think we've always thought of it as film, but it does seem like a lot of the best writing right now is going on in television. Uh, we're actually, I think, finding the opposite, that writers are extremely excited about what television offers and um, are eager to talk about how they can expand their their repertoire so they can deal with television. It's, it's, it's pretty remarkable that what has happened in the film business, which has essentially gone to action-adventure tent poles, uh, uh, in not, not compelling ways, uh, while it's going towards a formulaic uh, a strongly visual but formulaic presentation, television is taking the opposite tack and, and the characters are more intriguing, the storylines are more intriguing and people are relating. I, I just talked to someone, a friend uh, who's an analyst and she's crazed about Game of Thrones. Hmm. She just can't 
leave this series, you know. <laughs> and and so uh, for a person like this who's utterly literary, utterly, I mean, she's uh, you know she's uh, she's not she's my age, so she's not a spring chicken. So the fact that she's looking for novelty and turning to television for it is remarkable. So there, there is a, a I would call it a, a kind of storytelling shift going on between film and uh, what's going on on television. Well, and I guess we're also seeing a lot of uh, traditional film actors make stepping over to, to TV these days more and more each year. Partly, I guess, you know, that for, for men and women of a certain age, uh, there are only so many roles in film because they're not seen as, as drawing young people to the theater, but uh, also it's just better stuff being done for them, I guess. Um, well, if you look at something like Girls, you talk about an instant career maker. I mean, <laughs> uh, Dunham can now do virtually anything. She, she could run for the UN. Uh, <laughs> I mean, she could do anything. That's extraordinary. And, and that's, careers are being changed profoundly by television as we speak. Do you, uh, uh, just one or two more things about television in particular. We see, obviously, uh, Netflix is uh, doing its own stuff, House of Cards. They brought back uh, Arrested Development. They have other things. Oh. Uh, uh, Amazon is, is doing series. Do you, would you, I mean, would you expect to see them doing things that are more fitting with what you write about alternative um, script writing in terms of presenting an alternative? Or do you think that they're just going to go, you know, um, uh, com high, highest common denominator? Yeah. Um, I, I have not seen the new Arrested Development, but what I've read about it suggests that it's using a, a kind of uh, structure in which it it sort of gives repeated views on, on similar story material. Uh, that's certainly an interesting and alternative way to approach stories. Uh, and it seems like a very good way to solve the sort of issue of how does episodic television change when it's all released at one time. I think the other thing that, that seems to have some appeal is this binge viewing phenomenon where you see an entire season in a weekend. Uh, that's how I saw House of Cards, and it was great fun. So, so you know, I, I think it's opening up uh, avenues of consumer choice, consumer preference, but also a little more consumer control, all of which probably means something in those choices. House of Cards is also interesting because you can compare it to the BBC version, which is, you know, what, four hours rather than 13. And you can really see the difference in the story structure. Um, some of it's good, some of it's bad, but certainly the 13-hour American version opens up the kind of things uh, dealing with gender roles and power tensions that the British version really only vaguely touches on. All right, now no spoilers, fellas. I've only gotten through the first two hours so far. <laughs> oh, okay. My wife and I just started uh, started watching, uh, uh, actually both uh, House of Cards and Arrested Development this weekend. Uh, the kind of bargain is uh, an hour of this and a half an hour of that anytime we sit down. So, uh, But the House of Cards, uh, rem I think it's remarkably well written. And uh, at the same time, it doesn't seem to be written for a broad audience. There's a lot of people who are just not going to, Sit, sit through uh, a lot of the political uh, back and forth and, and trying to follow the players and, you know, who's, uh, who's after what. It, it, you've really got to focus on it, I guess. So, yeah. uh, My students liked it as, as, as a kind of opportunity for binge viewing, uh, less content-driven than media event, you know, so... It, it kind of struck them, uh, maybe some of the politics didn't really play with them or mean anything to them. Mm. Nope, I could see that. I could see that. Wh what about, uh, coming back to the book, um, is it getting harder and harder to qualify and quantify the word alternative in alternative script writing? Uh, yes, it, it is. And in the 
I think the previous edition, I added a chapter dealing with free act structure in which I sort of backed away from the really clear sense of difference uh, to say that the, the line has really blurred and that uh, in, in many more mainstream films, the structure is looser and more open than it used to be. And I think it, it absolutely is harder to clarify. And, and that's to the benefit, because as Ken says, you know, the film is, is changed increasingly to these big blockbusters and then a few films for a different kind of audience. And that those different kind of films are, I think, much more willing to blur that line. Well, I, I, I think we're seeing different kind of, of, of options with um, the term alternative. So going back to Spielberg, you know, Spielberg has always, his expertise is action adventure, you know, fantasy, you know, and so on. But occasionally he tries to break the mold. So he tries to do a war film that's utterly realistic in Private Ryan or Schindler. And, and then he tries to do something genre different in Munich and the audience totally rejects it. Then, you know, he sort of goes back to his action adventure and, and licks his wounds and then goes with Lincoln. Now, Lincoln was interesting to me because instead of exploiting his skills as an action adventure, as a camera, you know, uh, positioning the camera in the, you know, so close to the action that you couldn't help it, uh, you're there, he backs off totally and presents almost like a chain, Lincoln as a chamber piece. Now, to me, it was very audacious directing, and it was allowing language and performance to fully have front and center. So, to me, that's a kind of alternative to what he usually does and what he's known for. And what's interesting is how many people found they couldn't go with him in those changes. You know, they, we want the action. We want the old Steven. And, and both he and Soderbergh have sort of roamed around and sought, whether it's genre-wise or stylistically, different approaches. And that's, that's kind of alternative. But does the audience let them do it? And, and Jeff, uh, since Ken t picked up my challenge on uh, Spielberg, maybe you can t uh, pick up on uh, Soderbergh and kind of... Uh, uh, describe uh, the differences in, in his work, uh, certainly as compared to the alternative label. Um, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to pass on that because I have not seen his latest stuff. Um, but I do want to talk a bit more about Lincoln because right. I, th I think Lincoln is, a, is an extraordinarily interesting film to come out of Spielberg. And I, I think Ken is absolutely right that it's a film that's um, sort of breaks the mold in its willingness to allow language and uh, almost a meditation on language to dominate over the structure of action. And, uh, you know, that seems to me to be very much an alternative approach and, and really an astonishing film. Um, I, I went to that film kicking and screaming and, uh, and was very knocked out by what he was willing to do in terms of allowing it to have a kind of an, an abstract linguistic dimension that I've never seen in his work. Your, your reaction to Lincoln is where I am. I'm, I'm waiting for it on cable. I, I just couldn't bring myself to, to, to spend right. you know, $25 for the two of us to go see a movie about Lincoln at right. this point. I don't know. But I will watch it. Think about Tony Kushner. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> yeah. Great, great writer. Yeah, it's astonishing. Oh, what uh, what characteristics of alternative script writing do you want uh, do you want readers of your book to embrace, guys? Jeff. Um, yeah, Jeff. <laughs> well, I, I mean, I think um, the notion of formal innovation and innovation, the idea that uh, things will come along, cause people to refresh their view of film, to see. Um, uh, kind of the surface of the film or the formal elements of the film, but also a recognition that those things come, 
they reawaken us and that they have to somehow be reintegrated into story. And so there's always going to be a tension between sort of formal awareness and story. And that we, I think, want our audience to understand that and to recognize that that's a dynamic process. And that they, they and, and filmmakers will keep reinventing how to do that. Um, and so rather than sort of celebrate the films that did it, you know, once in the past and then sort of move on, I think the idea is to keep looking for that tension and how it plays out in contemporary work. You know, to add to, add to that, um, particularly in this country, because film is so um, successful a medium and we look to emulate success, uh, we believe that it's all formula. Uh, well, there are certain technical elements that, that most films share, but formula, you know, just looking at, at, at genre, you know, genre is flexible. It's not formulaic. It, it may have certain tropes, but it, it can be used by a filmmaker in any number of ways. So you can go dark, you can go light, you can, uh, you know, uh, de-emphasize the main character, you can emphasize the antagonist. I mean, there are so many options in pulling a story together in the way that you, the storyteller, wants. And I, I think for me, the, the, the great message of the book is really there are baselines in storytelling and the challenge for the filmmaker and the desire of the audience is so take me somewhere else. You know, I just I just read a a, a book which I'll mention uh, by James Salter called All That Is. Eighty five year old guy wrote a screenplay forty years ago called Downhill Racer. Has written only three or four books. Has lived a kind of sketchy life, but he's really He's so deep and wonderful a writer that he takes us into a world of a character. I'm not even sure we care about this main character, but we are deeply in it. And, you know, that's the challenge for writers, for filmmakers. They want to go farther with the audience. They want a deeper relationship with an audience. And it's, the formula is only the starting point. I think the alternative script writings, uh, the, the book the, in various versions has said, use this, go farther, take creative risks. And we've seen it in television. That's what they're doing. And there we are. Uh, and we look forward to others doing this, uh, other uh, Lincolns being done, you know, because that's, that is what is exciting, stimulating in making, writing, and making movies. What, uh, let's say someone's watching this and they still don't quite get what, what we're after here with alternative script writing. Can you guys point to some films through the generations or, 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 or that were pivotal to their eras that, that would qualify as alternative script writing? Well, it's funny because I'm, I'm, I'm now teaching a course on American independent features. We start in 1979 with Bush Mama, Haley Greene's film. And we go through things like She's Gotta Have It and Stranger Than Paradise and um, Daughters of the Dust. And, um, and these are, are really obviously aggressively formally different than most mainstream films. But then I think as you come into the last 10 years, there are films that are also different, but different maybe in more subtle ways. Um, films that, um, they, these, these original films I talked about are, uh, seem to really feel that they have to separate their audience from mainstream in a very aggressive way. I think later films are willing to accept that people are, are sort of able to make that separation and that the line isn't so clear cut. Um, and you're going to ask me to name a current one, and I'm blanking, so I'm going to throw it in. How about Stories We Tell? So, yes. Which uh, Sarah Pauly's film. Yeah. 
which some people will say is a documentary, but it's a it's actually uh, there's half the film is is enactments or reenactments with actors, and it blends in. And I was so annoyed when I saw that there were actors in it because I wanted to believe it was all real. But it is a wonderful uh, taking us deeply into identity, family. I, I thought it was an amazing film uh but thematically someone like uh, you know place beyond the pines tries to take us into family but it tries to take us in a in a different way than Polly. i mean you know i mean there there's there's some pretty interesting folks working in this independent space right now another film that strikes me is winter's bone um, and the, you know, the difference of Jennifer Lawrence in that film and how she then performs in the Silver Linings. Sure. And, uh, you know, Ken is talking about the sort of sense of there being almost real people in stories we tell. Well, you can watch Winner's Bones with almost no sense at all that these are actors. Um, and the, the writing and the flatness of the storytelling all works with, with that conceit. By the time you get the silver linings, you're clearly in a different a different world, and her performance is different. Um, and I, you know, I personally don't think it's anywhere near as compelling. I agree. I agree. So, guys, if there was a uh, if there was a an alt scriptwriters hall of fame, <laughs> who would be in it? Charmouche. Jim. Okay. All right. I I have a long long list. There are, I just watched a film by Carl Foreman, who, who wrote a film uh, called The Champion, which just got re-released. And the writing is astonishing. He was, he's, he's a remarkable writer. Um, I think Clifford Odette's in Sweet Smell of Success, uh, together with uh, Lehman, Lehman's story. That's a great piece of writing. I mean, Casey Robinson in Now Voyager, Paul Osborne, a playwright uh, who wrote East of Eden. That's a great adaptation. You know, uh, there's so many good screenwriters, but what I would note is that many of the screenwriters that I admire, they, they, they travel across media. You know, either they were playwrights or they're uh, also novelists. I'm a big admirer of, of David Benioff right now, who is the executive producer and one of the major writers on Game of Thrones. Well, Benioff wrote 25th Hour, which Spike Lee made into a film, and he also wrote a book called City of Thieves, a novel about his grandfather in the Siege of Leningrad. It's wonderful. Like, for me, great writing, it, it, it travels. So I, I, I certainly uh, admire the people who have, have said, I'm a writer, right now I'm writing for, for film, now I'm writing for television, maybe next week I'll be writing uh, uh, a short story for the New Yorker, I don't know. Or maybe highlights for children. <laughs> well, what, what, um, this is the uh, the fifth edition of alternative script writing. What's changed uh, from the previous edition, and what's really changed from the first edition? How how different, you know? Um, well, besides the television chapter, uh, I have a new chapter on um, uh, characters that are opaque and don't expose themselves in the way uh, characters traditionally do. And I start with um, um, Hurt Locker and the question of how do we understand the, uh, the arc of the character who, you know, leaves the war and then comes back. Um, and uh, so another element to me about alternative is uh, characters that evolve but are not, whose evolutions are not as... Um, has clearly um, spooned out to the audience as they are in, in some other films and the power they create. Um, 
Ken, do you want to talk about your new chapter? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I my new chapters are primarily about genre and how it's flexible and why genre is important and so on. But and there's a case study of two two uh, dark fables, uh, Wizard of Oz and uh, Pan's Labyrinth. But for me, what's changed from the first uh, to to now? I think what motivated us initially was so much the embrace of the Sidfield model of screenwriting, and I think we've traveled very far. And I think for me, the journey has suggested that uh, good writing always is is breaking one formula or another. And and so I think the original intent was to encourage more creative or personal writing. I think that remains at the heart of the book. But I th I think we've also uh, in the in the time of the book's life, seeing what was then unusual become mainstream, and 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 there every decade brings changes. Um, I'm thrilled to see the changes around television writing because I I do feel um, that's that's it's it's not a flash in the pan. I think we're going to see much more innovation, and I I think it's all about encouraging writers that there is no formula, no techniques, be interested in stories, respect your audience, and go go for it, you know, be brave. Uh, I think that's still there in the book. Uh, I'm excited, you know, I, what's going on in television, you know, people talk about transmedia and so on. Well, content remains the king. And so we are into uh, saying, let's make content the most interesting, the most stimulating, the best it can be. So we're in support as opposed to against the industry, but we are for quality in the industry, quality in the writing. Well, speaking of which, it just occurred to me that I neglected to point out what your day jobs are. Uh, I will say, Jeff is uh, in Philadelphia. He's a, an associate professor at uh, Temple University's Department of Film and Media Arts. And uh, Ken is in Manhattan. He's a professor of film and television at the Tisch School of the Arts at New York University. And so I, I mentioned that because I was thinking... I assume that film students are a big part of the audience for, for this book. Uh, what uh, you know? What are the most common mistakes that they make in writing scripts at this at this point in their careers? How long did you say this program? <laughs> uh, well, the common, the most common mistake they make is exactly I think what Ken is getting at, which is um, all of them. Uh, well, <laughs> but but they they tend to write what they have seen without um, being able to examine and integrate their own experiences and their own sensibilities into their writing. And some of what we have to do is sort of um, free them from feeling they simply have to make. Um, you know, Sid Field's expression about three acts was you pour your story into the structure. And to, to some extent, we have to uh, get them away from pouring their story and really to explore their story and understand what it means and then to give them the freedom to to uh, make them understand that there are many ways the story could be told and that we in the process will help them discover that. Um, so I think that to me that's the biggest thing that they're sort of unconsciously influenced by all the stuff they've seen and we have to free them and also have them step back and see that consciousness or make them conscious of that so that they can, um, you know, see what's shaping. Yeah, I, I, I think picking up on, on this theme, I think there's more to movies than sensation. And so we also have to uh, differentiate plot and character and and what I see is students are less interested in the notion that a character changes 
in the course of a story, and that that change is emotionally that's that's our our, our bloodline to connect to the movie. So if it's all plot, so where's the emotional connection? So I I find myself pressing closer to questions of character and character population and how the character will change in the course of the story. So I, to me those are those are, that's that's the front line right now here in New York. All right, one one more question still along the lines of film school. Uh, and this is, I guess I could say this is a personal question because I have a, uh, a uh, now high school senior who is planning to go to film school in a year and is in the next six months going to have to choose which one that is. I, 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 this is an odd way to end this, but would each of you like to discuss the strengths of your respective film schools? How about if Jeff... <laughs> talks about NYU and I'm going to talk about Temple. <laughs> okay, whatever you want to do. That's an interesting let, approach. Let's talk about Temple. <laughs> okay. Temple is a thoughtful mix of theory and practice that respects documentary, that respects experimental, that respects how those influence the mainstream. So to me, at Temple, if your child wants a very good mix of theory and practice, Temple is a very good school for that. Hmm. Very good. Jeff? Uh, and, um, and speaking about NYU, first of all, I would um, very much suggest that your daughter come visit both of us. And I think we would both be very glad to meet with her and... and you know, explain this in more detail. Um, but one of the, I think, key distinctions is that NYU is a BFA program, uh, which provides uh, more credits in, in film and more opportunity, I think, to really master the craft and the art of filmmaking. Um, Temple is a BA program, which limits the number of credits you can take in film to about 50 of 120 and is more about a kind of liberal arts degree. Um, there is enormous amount of debate about which is better, and it really depends on the student. And a lot of it, uh, a lot of the assumptions of a BFA is that the student will be engaged enough to find all that other stuff, uh, you know, on their own. Mm. Um, and uh, I think if a student is particularly motivated to see the art of filmmaking as an extension of human experience in the other arts, and will look that way, then a BFA probably makes more sense. If a student needs a sort of uh, more exposure to the liberal arts, then a BA makes more sense. And that may be part of the, the difference between the schools. Very good. Well, um, folks, listen, uh, thank you for that, guys. Uh, and I'll... Uh, I'll, uh, I'll put it up to the student and let her uh, figure it out. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure we're both, we both love to meet with her. All right. Thank you. Uh, folks, listen, you can find Alternative Script Writing, Beyond the Hollywood Formula, written by my guests today, Jeff Rush and Ken Danziger, in great stores everywhere, or you can order it right now at a great price at mrmedia.com. If you're watching this as a video, right below the video screen, you should see a copy of the book. You can click on it right now order it at a great price, and have it in days. Uh, guys, is there a website for the book, or do you individually have websites, Twitter, Facebook, any of that stuff? You know, good point. <laughs> we don't. The, the publisher has a website. Right. Uh, and we always can rely on Amazon. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Very good. Well, uh, uh, Ken Danziger, Jeff Rush, uh, Thank you guys so much. Good to see everybody uh, healthy and well. And uh, thanks for joining us today on Mr. Media. Thanks, Bob. Thanks, Bob. Take care. Bye. Bye-bye. All right. You can see and hear almost a 1,000 Mr. Media interviews by visiting our main site, mrmedia.com, mrmedia.com. Or check out the more than 200 video interviews on the Mr. Media radio site on YouTube. And I'd sure appreciate if you'd show some love for Mr. Media's advertisers, including Stitcher. Apple named Stitcher a top five news app of 2011. 
It's a free mobile app for your smartphone or tablet that lets you listen to your favorite shows and discover the best of news, entertainment, and sports on demand. You can listen whenever you want to to more than 5,000 shows, get customized recommendations, and discover what your friends are listening to. My own list of Stitcher favorites is pretty eclectic. I start my day with an hour of MSNBC's Morning Joe with Joe Scarborough and Mika Brzezinski. Then it's the latest two-minute update from the Onion News Network. After that, I'll listen to WTF with Mark Marin. Here's The Thing with Alec Baldwin, HBO's Real Time with Bill Maher, and excerpts from E's Chelsea Lately and The Soup with Joel McHale. Also in regular rotation on my Stitcher playlist, The BS Report with ESPN's Bill Simmons, The Tech Crunch Headlines, and The Don Geronimo Show. The latest episodes of each show, whether originating from broadcasts, cable TV, radio syndication, or podcasts, are continuously updated. Stitcher is a free app for your iPhone, iPad, Kindle, Fire, Blackberry, Droid, and more. And show your support of Mr. Media by getting, did I mention it's free? The app at stitcher.com slash mrmedia. That's stitcher.com slash mrmedia. Stitcher Smart Radio, the smarter way to listen to radio. We're also supported by Audible. Check out Audible's 30-day trial membership and download the audiobook version of the book everyone's been talking about, Fifty Shades of Grey by E.L. James. Sign up for your free trial today at audible.com slash radio. Again, audibletrial.com slash radio. And finally, if you need a disc jockey for a wedding, bar mitzvah, corporate event, or just a big old party, please consider calling 1-800-DIAL-DJs, the party authority, for all your party entertainment needs. You can call 1-800-DIAL-DJs or go to their website, 1-800-DIAL-DJs.com, and tell them Mr. Media sent you. And thanks for listening. Today's episode of Mr. Media Interviews is brought to you by GoDaddy.com. You know GoDaddy.com from their wild and sexy commercials, but isn't it time you actually test drove their web hosting and domain registration services yourself? For a limited time, Mr. Media listeners can save 10% on the already low price of web hosting services at GoDaddy.com by entering the promo code POD4 at checkout. Again, that's 10% off web hosting when you go to GoDaddy.com and enter the promo code POD4, that's P-O-D, the number 4, at checkout.